Uh, welcome everybody to what is now the ninth lecture in our summer lecture series titled From the Rooftops. These lectures are coming to you from the Landscape Architecture faculty in the Landscape Architecture Department here in the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Richard Weller and I'm the chair of the department and today it's my great pleasure to introduce Keith Vandersis. Keith Vandersis is the media director in the Landscape Architecture Program here at Penn. He is also the co-founder of PEG, Office of Landscape Plus Architecture. This is an award-winning design and research practice based here in Philadelphia. Using new media and fabrication technologies, PEG's work explores methods of systemic patterning to expand landscape's expressive agency in the shaping of the public realm. The firm has been published extensively and won numerous design awards. Most recently, PEG, as part of a University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design team, in association with the San Francisco office of Bionic, was selected as one of 10 teams in the Rockefeller Foundation's Bay Area Resilient by Design project. Keith is co-author with Karen McCloskey of the book Dynamic Patterns, Visualising Landscapes in a Digital Age. This was published by Routledge in 2017. This book situates the emerging expressions of pattern in landscape architecture and argues for their importance in the design process. Both he and McCloskey are guest editors of the issue of LA Plus, the interdisciplinary journal of landscape architecture produced here in the Weitzman School of Design on the theme of simulation. They are also the guest editors of a second issue of LA Plus titled LA Plus Geo. Keith has an MA in Critical Studies in architecture, Architectural Culture from the University of California in Los Angeles. He also holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Detroit. So please join me today in welcoming Keith to the digital lectern. Enjoy the lecture. Thanks for the introduction, Richard. Thanks to all of you, uh, both current and prospective students who are joining me today in this virtual event. As Richard noted, uh, my work with my partner, Karen McCloskey, over the last decade has been focused on the impacts and opportunities that digital media and computation brings to the discipline of landscape architecture. Some of this work has been developed through courses and special topic seminars and remote sensing and environmental simulation that I teach. As part of this interest, uh, recently with Sean Burkholder, we also started the MLAB, which is short for the Environmental Modeling Research Group, which is part of the Ian McCarg Center. Uh, we're going to have a website up for that soon, so look forward to that. Um, as part of this work, Karen and I have also pursued uh, this line of inquiry through writing. Re recent pieces of note include our book, Dynamic Patterns, Visualizing Landscapes in a Digital Age, it was published in 2017. We've also guest edited two LA Plus issues, the first being on the theme Simulation, which was published in 2016, and then more currently, or presently working on an issue thematic uh, entitled Geo, and that'll be published later this fall. So I thought I'd use this opportunity to kind of flush out some preliminary thoughts around the remote sensing and simulation work that we've been doing recently. So uh, I'm going to jump in and start the talk with these two images. Uh, on the left, I'll have the world's first underwater photograph taken by Luis Patana in 1900. And then the image on the right appeared a uh, short 10 years later in 1910, which is the first infrared photograph taken by Robert Williams Wood. Similar in their otherworldly beauty, what these early photographs elevate for me at least, is an attention to the environment in which both are set. It may be hard to tease out the particulars in this reproduction of Wood's infrared photo, but when inspected closely, one starts to notice that the black sky in the background actually lightens as it approaches the horizon, the effect of which is caused by the increased scattering of light rays and atmospheric mass as it thickens near the Earth's horizon. You can spend time examining these images and one's attention slowly moves from the intended feature to the focus 
um, to that of the image background or setting. And as such, as a kind of object of concern and study, one begins to understand that the environment is not a neutral container, but rather an active field where phenomena like the transmission of light, be it artificial, natural, visible, or invisible, is shaped by the physical properties of the milieu through which it moves. These two early optical marvels are characteristic of and instrumental to the sensing advancements developed later in the 20th century. Not only did these early moments of optical invention bring an expanded sensory field to humans' eyes and thereby open up new horizons of insight, they also helped, in part, to bring a particular form of the Earth into view. The environment, at least this particular form of it, came into focus as a recognizable object of concern, of study, of measurement, and management with the environmentalism of the United States, uh, 60s and 70s in the United States. While it exerted influence conceptually in the fields of biology and ecology previously, it entered the mass imagination by way of global imagery abetted by space technologies like those of satellites. The earliest picture of Earth, for instance, was captured on April 1st, 1960, when the U.S. Weather Bureau launched the Chiros-1 weather satellite into orbit. Fascinated by the possibilities of high-altitude photography, weather scientists hope to capture Earth's macro-scale weather patterns by assembling a mosaic of individual Tiros photographs. NASA was then able to produce a complete view of the Earth's diameter for the first time. Tiros was promptly followed by the first colored photographs of the whole Earth, uh, named the Earthrise, December 25th, 1968 and thereafter the Blue Marble, December 7, 1972. No one anticipated the impact of whole Earth imagery more presciently than to do a brand. Quote, the image confirmed a widespread feeling of global fragility and seemed to promise the dawning of a new consciousness of hu human commonality and ecological embeddedness, end quote. For media theorist Marshall McLuhan, the moment after the first satellite, be, uh, that being Sputnik 1, launched into space, quote, the planet became programmable content and thus became an art form. Ecology was born and nature was obsolesced. The concept of planetary, planetary ecology came into play at once. Spaceship Earth was recognized as having not passengers, but only crew, end quote. For McLuhan and others, this meant that there was no longer an outside for the natural world, only an inside of which humans were a part. In Earthrise, How Man First Saw the Earth, Robert Poole captures this point, quote, the idea that the Earth as this finite system, which needed to be carefully managed, had been taking shape in a generation after the Second World War. In fields of thought as diverse as cybernetics, ecology, and geography, but it only really took off when the sight of the whole Earth gave humanity a picture to think with. End quote. It's no coincidence then that the space age of the 60s and 70s coincided with the rise of environmentalism movement in the United States. The Tiros, Earthrise, and Blue Marble imagery, for instance, were promptly followed by the first Earth Day. It was only through the perceptual journey from ground to whole earth that humans would make a leap from a localized landscape to that of Mother Earth. It should be noted here, however, a growing body of literature has continued to revisit the tension between the environmentalism of the Space Age era and the often imperialistic rhetoric of one home, one people that accompanies this overarching narrative. There's a lot of important work from a wide range of disciplines that critique mainstream environmentalism, and rightly so. So while I can't go into that in this short talk, my point is that this particular view of Earth Day environmentalism came by way and through media. Once the notion of a global environment came into view, 
however, the question of, uh, to many was, how do you come back down to Earth? While the 60s and 70s environmentalism exerted a significant influence on the fields as diverse as geography to literary criticism over the following decades, a critical appraisal of its influence on landscape architecture didn't appear until the late 90s, early 2000s. A burst of academic theoretical appraisals began to em emerge, for instance, around the special issue of Landscape Journal's eco-revelatory design, Nature Constructed, Nature Revealed, and subsequently, Michelle Cohen's edited volume, Environmentalism in Landscape Architecture. In landscape architecture, the environmental writing that influenced the field, particularly in the U.S., uh, the post-Earth Day response was framed in terms drawn from an ethic of proximity. As Elizabeth Meyer states in her Environmentalism and Landscape Architecture essay, if, quote, if the phenomenology of landscape architecture taps into the concrete experience of a place by its citizens, and if those experiences intermingle cyclical natural processes with the rhythms of collective social life, then this type of built work can redefine what it means to be part of the environment, end quote. She continues quoting Ar Arnold Bertillant that, quote, to grasp the environment, every vestige of dualism must be discarded. There is no inside and outside, human being and external world, no discrete self or separate other, end quote. So in this framework, not only is the environment a milieu that is directly experienced, but these experiences are thought to move us to act on behalf of the environment. Empathy as such is presumed to arise from situated knowledge, a sensing body in place rather than more abstract or distant forms of knowledge acquisition. As with Meyer, a number of other authors, Catherine Howitt, Carolyn Merchant, Louise Mozingo, Robert Thayer, for example, in both of these collections, place the heavy emphasis on phenomenological approaches as the basis for a new landscape aesthetic, one that derives from an individual's direct experience with the physical environment. The work, especially in the field of environmental humanities and eco-criticism over the last two decades, however, have taken issue with this version of environmental knowing and its over-reliance on individual direct experience perspectives. As Ursula Heisa notes in A Hitchhiker's Guide to Eco-Criticism, quote, phenomenological approaches have done little to offer clear models for mediated and collected experiences of nature. Neither do they provide the means for explaining how the authenticity of natural encounters is itself culturally shaped, end quote. A good amount of academic criticism around representation, also in the late 90s, began to broach this issue by inter interrogating the modes and methods used to depict nature and the environment. In particular, landscape architects' over-reliance on photographic pictorialism, for instance, privileged an anthropocentric view of nature as scenographic image, thereby rendering it as an object of control and thus distancing humans from nature. Gina Crandall goes on to kind of aptly characterize this point in Nature Pictorialize, quote, human beings believe they are separate from nature, which they view it as an object, more specifically, a pictorial object. This means what we think of nature has been mediated by pictorial activities, such as appropriation, framing, and representing, end quote. So uh, this kind of decentering of the pictorial uh, this generation of critics uh, aspired to elevate the material of landscape over its visual appearance. Yet, all media is just that, a mediation. So rather than occlude any particular type of media, it's better to ask what is privileged or deprivileged in our choice of media. And given that so much of how we make drawings and models has changed since the last, you know, since the last 20 years, it's important to reflect on how these changes operate within landscape architecture. Criticisms of digital media, for instance, suggest that 
such media, unlike hand drawing, further distances us from the material world. This assumes, however, that there are more immediate or more authentic ways of knowing. That one can have a pre-technical experience when it comes to nature or the environment. This postulation of authenticity, however, assumes that modern humans are alienated from nature by technological systems. As David Harvey points out, however, in Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference, that, quote, the problem of authenticity itself is particularly modern. Only as modern industrialization separates us from the processes of production and we encounter the environment as a finished commodity does it emerge. The final victory of modernity is not the disappearance of the non-modern world, but its artificial preservation and reconstruction. The search for an authentic sense of community and of an authentic relation to nature among many radical and ecological movements is the cutting edge of exactly such a sensibility." End quote. So understood in this way, as both derived from and resistant to modernity, may help landscape criticism develop modes of critique of the modern that are less dependent than they've been so far on a recourse to pre-modern or pre-technical forms of inhabitation and culture. Furthermore, as John, Jonathan Carreri so eloquently points out in Techniques of the Observer, quote, whether a subject's perception or vision actually changes is irrelevant, for they have no autonomous history. What changes are the plural forces and rules composing the field which perception occurs. There was or never will be a self-present beholder to whom a world is transparently evident." End quote. Following up on this sentiment, Signal, Image, and Architecture by John May echoes this point, albeit a bit more bluntly. Quote, Axiom 1. There are no pre-technical thoughts. Thought is always already mediated and never immediate. End quote. So be it language, writing, drawing, or other, our perception is mediated technologically. This in no way discounts the material reality of the environment and environmental degradation. Rather, it acknowledges that our ideas and experiences of the environment are a complex discursive construct whose reality of which derives by the way in which we speak, write, and image it. An acknowledgment of such would seem to offer promising theoretical avenue for which to pursue the analysis of landscape criticism and production. The sentiment of Meyer and others that we pay attention to the dynamics of the environment, uh, that the medium and the substance of the ground are intermingled, is of great significance. However, we do not have to do away with the technical systems of mediation altogether in order to achieve this understanding. To the contrary, tools of Earth Day environmentalism may at times help us see past the entrenchment of our old tools, providing other ways to define what it means to be part of the environment. Ways that do not uphold the binary between global systems of knowledge and localized experience. <clears throat> Yet generations of landscape architects since post-Earth Day environmentalism have continued to subscribe to orthographic methods for analysis, conceptualization, and visualization, even as the environmentalism they were originally moved to act came by way of a very different technical paradigm. Pollution sensors, multispectral imagery, GPS, desktop computing, all for instance, were already quite prevalent by the mid-90s. While I in no way mean to dismiss the efficacy of hand drawing, it is rooted, however, in the culture of orthographic media, one that's mistakenly been understood as being pre-technical. Here, returning to May's signal image architecture is instructive as he deftly unpacks the distinctions between orthographic, photographic, and image formats. To quote May, 
quote, drawings are a hand mechanical geometric storage format. Photographs are chemical or electronic storage. And images are statistical electrical storage formats, end quote. While the former is always a visual rule-based geometric system, typically aesthetically guided, the latter are now electrostatistical and thereby stored, calculated, and managed through various algorithms. You could think or, or say that these are processed rather than produced. So more importantly, drawing is always restricted to a local presence limited by a human agent's physical and visual domain, and therefore only coincidentally geographic. While electrostatistical processing entails telemetric transmission of geolocated data, and is therefore inherently geographic and only coincidentally local. So sketching on a tablet, snapping a picture with your phone, or even the simplest of photo editing and illustrating tasks all entail, at the very least, geolocated time stamping of algorithmic processes. These two modes, drawing and processing, also record and structure time in radically different fashions. Orthography operates diachronically, with each mark having a beginning, middle, and end, while processing entails the synchronic real-time processing of calculable functions. Given the ubiquity of telemetric processes today, an engagement in the field activities, uh, as have been touted by others as the basis to de-distance, might rather arise from the benefits and opportunities of calibrating the synchronic real-time of calculable processes with a diachronic historical time of the physical environment. This would serve as a grounding to test or evaluate the productive efficacy of an informational model and mode with that of the material. What May's forensic account of post-60s media highlights, importantly, is that the information we work with since that period is inextricably post-orthographic. And while it may appear at times to be the same as earlier formats, it fundamentally performs differently. This shift is significant if we assume that the media milieu in which we live, as media theory does, affects how we understand and act in the world. A point most aptly captured by Marshall McLuhan's famous quip, quote, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, end quote. Aspiring, uh, arising primarily through the work of McLuhan in the 60s, media theory, later known as media ecology, articulated how various modes of communication technologies form information systems and affect human perception. Media as such are not mere tools of human use, but rather they constitute environments within which we move. They shape the structure of our perceptions, our forms of discourse, and our social behaviors. Media, then, don't just transmit and transport information, they also transform. Here a point from Neil Postman's Technopoly, first published in 1993, uh, later updated in 2011, it makes a useful point. Quote, technological change is neither additive nor subtractive, it is ecological. I mean ecological in the same sense as the word is used by environmental scientists. One significant change generates total change. If one removes the caterpillars from a given habitat, you are not left with the same environment minus caterpillars. This is how the ecology of media works as well. New technologies alter the structure of our interests, the things we think about. They alter the character of our symbols, the things we think with, and they alter the nature of community, the arena in which thoughts develop and are played out." End quote. If then we accept media as co-constitutive to our understanding and operating in, within, or through an environment, then the nature of a message is fundamentally transformed as it's translated through a medium. Rather than representing a condition, it is rather presented anew. 
This in no way discounts a material reality, but rather acknowledges the mutually constructive act of any medium. An outer essence of the environment, say as an ontological given, is thus impossible to capture and convey by any medium. Furthermore, this also makes any distinction um, between a separate subject, medium, and environment untenable. While each realm is in many ways distinguishable from the other, but they are also intertwined and mutually transformative. This is exactly what proponents of the post-Earth Day era landscape criticism sought, but rather inadvertently either overlooked or purposefully dismissed the significance of the medium in the environmental messages they sought to convey. While this may all seem rather technologically deterministic, the framing of media ecologically puts the emphasis on the interconnected relationships among various media with their specific material and, importantly, social environments within which they operate. In information ecologies using technology with heart, Bonnie Nardi and Vicky, Vicky O'Day use this framing as a means to quote, travel beyond the dominant image of a tool metaphor, an image of a single person and his or her interactions with technology, to instead spotlight the interconnectedness of people, practices, values, and technologies in a particular environment, with the belief that people have leverage to affect technological change by acting in the spheres where they have knowledge and authority, end quote. Uh, they call this their own information ecologies. I find this sentiment both refreshing and inspiring. We often fo focus our attention on a particular technology, computers, phones, networks, and the like, but it's in the spaces between and through these things that are critical and often where the most transformative things happen. The spaces and technologies are, of course, diverse in their type and use, and particular to any given domain of application. A technology differs in each local setting since its perceived role, availability, and use are particular to that environment. But it also pertains to people. The social and technical aspects of an environment co-evolve as people learn, adapt, and create new rhythms and patterns of use. Rather than blissfully promoting or simply dismissing technology, Yardi and O'Day believe that individuals can have an active role, a unique and valuable local perspective in how technology can be transformed productively for human use and creativity. This is only possible for them by paying attention to it, um, by what they call the practice of cultivating gardeners, which are people with homegrown expertise who translate concepts and mechanism back and forth between the domain of work and technology itself. Gardeners are, for Nardi and O'Day, quote, insiders, hobbyists and professionals in whatever domain, working intensively with both tools and people to translate tools and techniques across groups, assisting collaborators and coworkers, thereby enriching the practice of the collective. Gardeners play a valuable role in their ecologies, emphasizing the importance of diverse contributions and local connections among people and their tools and practices." End quote. This all seems like a productive positioning for our field, we work frequently as intermediaries among the informational, material, and social realms, but at scales that far exceed any one constituency, agency, or political geography. Yet there's a strong sense of locality in gardening practices. Others have recently advocated for landscape architects to re-engage the local by getting their hands dirty through gardening practices. That's surely one way to engage, but not the only one. While I agree with the hands on the tool aspiration, we should not repeat or return, however, to a similar paroxysmal ethic of post-Earth Day phenomenological criticism, which eschewed mediation. 
Our most critical habitats and biomes, for instance, are frequently subject to macroclimatic fluctuations that far exceed our in-person, on-the-ground comprehension, either temporally or dimensionally. Whether we acknowledge or engage it or not, we typically come to understand the local effects of global influences meaningfully through media. For landscape architects and others, environmental data frequently forms the basis for how we analyze and understand a region's biophysical patterns and trends. Yet we mostly lack hands-on-the-tool proximity to the practices of data collection, delineation, and classification as defined by the cultures and protocols of its originating institutions, industries, and individuals. This form of distancing, I'd say, is particularly fraught, given that these information ecologies typically play a significant role in determining how and where we engage locally. Take the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's National Wetland Inventory as an example. The NWI is the single most important environmental data set in the country. It's crit critical to environmental policy actions, federal, state, county, and local project permitting, and constitutes an important feature in any storm surge and sea level model. Yet despite years of federal and state and local regulations to protect wetlands, the U.S. has lost well over 360,000 acres in just five short years between 2004 and 2009. Uh, that's the last data by FWS published in 2011. The loss is primarily attributed to the development, to development and increased storm and sea level rise. To retar retard further loss, and degradation, Fish and Wildlife Services points to the urgent need for more accurate uh, geospatial data. So even though many areas in the inventory haven't been updated since the 70s, and more alarmingly, the average age of the data set is more than 30 years old. Environmental regulation and policy decisions are thus often based on outdated conditions that no longer exist. Given past and present trends of wetland loss, this frequently leads to a vast overestimation of a region's overall ecological diversity and resiliency. Fish and Wildlife Services, however, hasn't collected its own wetland data since the completion of the inventory in the 80s. While Fish and Wildlife Services is still in the business of creating wetland mats, its scope has narrowed significantly with the defunding of federal environmental research and oversight since the 80s, federal organizations like Fish and Wildlife Services have been reduced to coordinating and management roles. Any assessment or updates that do happen are now left to third-party contractors who are primarily funded through state and local initiatives. What few areas are updated are also now almost exclusively done by way of modern high-resolution satellite imagery. Yet, per Fish and Wildlife Service's wetland mapping guidelines, remote detection methods are as much technological savvy as they are sleuthing skills of a well-trained eye. A database of this magnitude and importance in need of frequent updates can only retain a usable level of accuracy with advanced remote imaging and analysis abetted by a large and diverse community of knowledgeable stewards, like those of a well-trained landscape community potentially. We very much depend on good data like this as a discipline. The U.S., however, is only one of two countries across the globe where spatial data is free and publicly available. In Canada, as a comparison, users have to pay for data access. We often assume unfoundedly that the accuracy and availability of such critical environmental data will remain freely available in perpetuity. This wasn't always the case, however. When geospatial practices arose in the 60s and 70s, and also well into the 80s, basic data of natural systems that form the basis of ecological assessments didn't exist. 
That data, in most instances, needed to be created by, by way of self-organized coalitions between scientists and landscape architects. Yet with the continual erosion of federal funding and state funding for environmental science, regulation, and data collection, one can easily foresee a return to a do-it-yourself need for absent data on the near horizon. If we're going to cultivate a new generation of gardeners, then, they need the unique and valuable talents to thrive within this shifting information ecology. Uh, these ideas have uh, guided our work and writing over the past couple of years. Uh, with the short time I've got left, uh, I'd like to share a couple of projects um, and, that are new and ongoing that try to engage and expand landscape architects' role in this kind of informational ecology that we operate today. Uh, the last three years, along with my partner Karen McCloskey, we've had ongoing coastal resiliency work in Puerto Bacarezo Moreno on the island of San Cristobal, uh, Puerto Bacarezo Moreno, and Santa Cruz are the two most populous towns in the archipelago. Um, you may not know this, but 97% of the land in the Galapagos is protected from development. Uh, immigration from the mainland of Ecuador has been curbed, but the population continues to rise. Uh, at re recent growth rates, approximately about 6% a year, San Cristobal is going to potentially fill out its urban boundary in shortly as 15 to 20 years. So to start to address the risks and opportunities related to the town's water, uh, our team began by mapping and analyzing the town's existing topography, ravines, watersheds, and water quality issues, which are all critical for managing, for instance, rain flow uh, from the highlands. Uh, there really isn't a history of planning in the region, and the kind of absence of organized planning, um, Puerto Bacarizo Moreno, the open spaces are disappearing quickly. Um, and this is happening without regard to topography. There's a kind of piecemeal development that's going to only exacerbate town flooding and put more people in harm's way. Um, and in particular, the ravines are abused and kind of overlook social and ecological resource. Uh, so that was one of our agendas, is how we could recast the ravines as a new vital resource ecologically and socially. Given that the Galapagos Islands is one of the most significant uh, kind of studied, scientifically studied sites in the world, it lacks some basic data like water elevation. The tide gauges, for instance, lack a unified vertical datum. They're only benchmarked locally. So you can't actually determine the height of the water relative to land. So to get this data, we reached out to InnoCar. That's the kind of uh, Ecuadorian equivalent to our NOAA to get that data. Uh, their response was surprising. Rather than providing the data, they asked for our assistance in collecting it. Uh, this data is essential. Uh, especially in the context of conditions like population growth, resiliency, and these kind of conservation efforts that are needed to protect the natural resources across the archipelago. Um, shockingly, this kind of lack of critical information, however, isn't uncommon or isolated to the Galapagos. Looking at the, the regions in dashed lines, there's a large number of countries that lack a unified vertical datum. And a lot of these regions, like the Galapagos, are highly vulnerable to tsunamis. And they also house kind of high concentrations of dense, vulnerable coastal populations. So we took a trip down there last summer in which we uh, collected approximately 24 hectares of centimeter level survey data along the town's shoreline and also benchmark the tidal gauge. Um, our team used off-the-shelf UAVs and GPS GNS uh, site survey equipment to record the aerial survey information, both the shoreline, the ravines, and the tide gauge. So the result is we get a high accuracy data set, 
Here it's coded by elevation. This data set is geographically registered to a global coordinate system, a world global coordinate system of 1984. So now any future elevation measurements can be compared to these georeference points. We can also take that data set and classify it materially, distinguishing between ground, buildings, and vegetation. So here's an animation of the completed model. Uh, we delivered that model to InnoCar uh, early or late last year. Uh, and so in the coming year, uh, when we can travel again, hopefully, uh, we'll be returning to the Galapagos to survey the remaining three tidal gauges across the archipelago. Um, the present elevation data is presently calculated through satellite imagery, really common. Um, this method, while imperative for estimating sea level rise, can be highly inaccurate. So when we take that data set and correct it with our high accuracy elevation data, you can see here by a comparison of the upper and lower, uh, that the future flood threats are much higher than previously understood. The next project comes from a seminar I co-taught last fall. One of the co-instructors is Sean Burkholder. Uh, and we're going to be teaching that again since it's ongoing research. Uh, this seminar and the work with the Wetlands Institute really grew out of our remote sensing work and Sean's ongoing collaborations with them down in the Living Lab in New Jersey. The Lit Wetland, Wetland Institute's Living Lab has an important, uh, kind of been an important locus. Uh, it's, a, it's a field site for collecting and communicating the value and vulnerability of coastal wetlands. Uh, this twin mission presented a unique opportunity for us and our students. Uh, we got to kind of test the capacities of multispectral remote sensing to capture and convey wet changes. <clears throat> As noted early, Earlier, uh, our coastlines are changing quickly. The fluctuating nature of coastal wetlands makes them hard to access and monitor, whether using field surveying or aerial photography. Yet to make informed decisions about these coastal ecosystems, management authorities, nonprofits, and residents need to understand what's at stake in the changes afoot. This is where UAVs hold promise. You know, this kind of low cost and open source surveying and sensing equipment have become widely available now. The kind of chance to expand the sensing community with a broader citizenry to augment data gaps in areas where they work and live. I think the kind of profound difference today isn't necessarily the quantity and quality of the sensing equipment and the data, but those who have access to it there's a kind of democratizing effect to citizen-led sensing practices. Standard commercially available UAVs, however, lack per the precision geolocation to accurately survey uh, these regions. The, the drones need some form of enhancement via, say, real-time kinematic positioning to achieve that precision of kind of survey-grade data. For us, this was overcome with the use of in-field survey equipment. This in-field sensing links the local observations to the kind of whole earth technologies uh, that are indicative of large-scale environmental data sets and models. To prepare our students, the seminar included in-class demos, lectures, and field collection trips. Here's some action shots of instructors and students taking part in those activities. Uh, wetland composition and coverage are difficult to understand and access, however, without the aid of multispectral imagery. Uh, this allows us to capture the invisible properties and processes of plant communities by recording their unique spectral signatures. And the and unique spectral signatures are given off by both organic and inorganic materials as they reflect and absorb light. So for instance, wetland grasses like seashore salt grass, smooth cord grass, and salt metal cord grass all, slightly diff all have slightly differ differing spectral properties. Even with a kind of small sample, we can use the multispectral data to train the computer to identify and locate specific plants or material types. In our case, we uh, first field identified and documented wetland patches throughout the site. 
Each species patch was then located and marked in our multispectral set to create a series of training samples. These training samples were then fed into machine learning algorithms so that could then automatically locate and classify the remainder of similar pixels throughout the image. This classification process is dependent upon the accuracy and quality of the remotely sensed imaging, however. Uh, wetland plants are highly sensitive to any alteration and kind of tidal elevation. Uh, satellite imagery, at least that which is publicly available, is usually too coarse to detect the patterns of change that are consequential to plant health and loss. So here's an example of high resolution 3D survey uh, data set as part of the Wetland Institute collection. Uh, here's that same area using an NDVI analysis, uh, which is short for no Normalized Different Vegetation Index. It's an index which measures the uh, amount of chlorophyll concentrations in plant material, and it's typically a good indicator of overall plant health. The collection and classification process was run at two scales, bay-wide and two subsites. That information needed included high-resolution multispectral imagery, here taken from the Sentinel-2 collection, a detailed topobathy dem, and then after running the classification process, we get a re resulting material classification and distribution, which can then be used for running sea level rise simulation using NOAA's SLAM modeling which the uh, acronym is, stands for Sea Level Affecting Marsh Modeling. Uh, back in GIS, uh, we can then analyze and measure any consequential wetland changes like composition, connectivity, and compactness metrics. So here's an example of one of our research, our student research group's agenda and process. This group, for instance, focused on wetland nesting habitats for key wading bird species along the region's coastal zone. As a result of the analysis, the students were able to measure and evaluate the changes in the wetland patches for these key bird species over a 50-year horizon. So I'll conclude with this parting thought. It is incongruous that when it comes to design methods, that pertain to natural materials and processes, landscape architects have adopted the knowledge provided to us by others who use remote sensing and computation for understanding processes, namely scientists and engineers, without considering how they might change our practices. Rather than assume that the virtual form is immaterial, we should instead, as Catherine Yusoff argues, quote, become more precisely attuned to its forms of materiality.